music connections, starting a nonprofit, and life advice with Nicolasa Custer. Stay inspired. I'd love to start out chatting about the importance of making connections in music and in life. Well, there are people in this room who've influenced me. Hello, everybody. This is so cool. You never know, really, who who is going to be important in your life, right? Um, you just don't know who's going to be important in your life. People come back around. So, um, you know, the person who... You know, you have, I don't know, like you're struggling with something like vibrato and every teacher is teaching you how to do vibrato and every, and you're just struggling over and you're trying and people are telling you you're not doing it right. And then you try to learn how to do it. And, you know, and, and, and then that one lesson you have with somebody who says, just vibrate, it's life in the sound. And then suddenly you're like, oh, now I can, now I know what vibrato is. It makes sense for me. And that moment you know, you, you have, who, who knows when it's going to happen, right? So you have to just be ready for them, you know, to get those insights. And so I feel like my, my journey was just a collection of those insights. And it wasn't like one teacher wasn't teaching me, right? It was that I just needed to hear things in five different ways before it, I finally heard it. So that was Bruce Granger who said life in the sound. I was like, okay, that made sense for me. So I really, I really love it when a student comes back to me and says, oh, I just took a lesson from so-and-so and I just got so much. I mean, how come you didn't tell me this? And I'm like, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, the way well, it's fill in the blank. It's just brilliant the way they explained it. I'm like, mm-hmm. great, great. I just, you know, so there's some constants. I mean, you know, for example, I talked about Layla, Layla Zamora, who you, yeah. who you talked to. I met her when I was 16 years old. She was like excited to tell me about the bassoon. She was a professional, so she was my first role model of a woman in a leadership position because she was principal of the Costa Rica National Symphony at the time, and I was a high schooler in Panama. And she gave me some basics and went on. And then when we reconnected, when I was in the Civic Orchestra of Chicago, and she was also in Civic, then she became kind of a coach where I would play my excerpts for her, and she would be honest, like really honest. And I have notebooks and pages of notes that she took about out of tune, you know, just really clear feedback that I then had for my whole career. Like I'll still ask her to listen to me, you know? So there are people like that to collect in life. People who will really tell you the truth. Carol's made a really lovely comment about just, yeah, collecting people. Yeah. The start of, of Meg Quigley is, you know, about 15 years ago. Yeah, I mean, we started all the paperwork in 2004, and we had our first competition in 2005. It's been a big part of my life for 15 years. I've had sleepless nights and a lot of stress and a lot of joy as well. That's a good place <laughs> to collect people. Like the Meg Quigley community is, um, is, is like no other, you know? We, we realized right away after the first one that we needed to have the, the, the women finalists be able to be with each other more because that was going to be part of it was collecting them. Like they were going to collect each other. <laughs> and so each, each iteration, we found ways for them to actually spend more time together and, and get an experience of bonding. And there's 50... There's 60 of them now, I think, total. Young women who've ex- who have had this experience. Yeah. And so many people helping, you know, what a family that y'all have created with all of us. Cool. And, That's good yeah. To hear. Carol shared this was her first Meg Quigley Vivaldi competition experience oh. this year and just is uh, very grateful that you made it um, virtual so, so it could be more accessible to people. So that's great. And we're already talking about how we can make the next one. Also, like even though it's going to be in person because that's, you're going to do it in person. But how can we also make it available to people from far away? You know, I mean, a lot of it came out of me feeling excluded. Mm -hmm. I had a big chip on my shoulder early in my career where I just didn't feel like I belonged. 
And my first, you know, IDRS conference, I just did not feel like I was a part of any of it. And I didn't, I couldn't figure out how I was going to fit, you know, and I had a lot of chips on my shoulders about it. So I wanted something that I did belong in. <laughs> so the idea to have 50% women at every event and every group of judges and everything about it was like a, really so that I could feel like I belong. Kristen Wolf Jensen taught me this trick. We went, I met her. Okay. So we reconnected because I went to the IGRS conference in 2000 in Argentina and we had been out of touch this whole time since Oberlin when I, when we worked, when she was my secondary teacher. So I went to Argentina because I had entered the gelée competition and had not made Silk it as a finalist. And I had tried so many times and I really, really wanted that in my life. And I had just gotten Wichita State. So I was an academic suddenly. And so I was like, well, I'm going to go to Argentina now that I'm a college professor and I'm going to do the thing that you're supposed to do. And I'll go to the finals and see what all the fuss is about. So that's when I reconnected with Kristen. Like we hadn't even seen each other in years. So Fast forward to the next time we went together to Melbourne, Australia for the IDRS. And we were going there specifically to launch our competition. We got a table, we got, I got some suits to wear. We got these flyers, I had a banner. We, we were really launching this officially. And I felt so like I still didn't belong. And I said, how do you, how do you break into these clusters of people who know each other and you know, and she says, you do elbow hand. You walk up, you elbow your way in and you stick out your hand. So the elbowing in, you just gotta get used to doing that. And if you stick out your hand, someone else is going to reach out and grab it and say their name and you'll say their name and they'll go on from there. And you gotta practice, decide how many times you'll do this before lunch and how many times you'll do it after lunch. And so I said, okay, at this conference, I'm gonna elbow hand five times before lunch and five times after lunch. And I just made myself elbow hand it and I got, much better at it and I still to this day just think to myself when I'm feeling like I'm not a part of something like oh, hand, oh, hand. okay just go <laughs> great tip um Carol uh, mentioned starting something new starting a business starting a nonprofit, starting a community you know from the struggles and the joys could you share anything that comes to mind just from looking back and 2004 and and to now yeah i mean i i knew that we need it was really it was i still remember how nervous how scared and nervous i was to ask people for support and help like i and if i knew now if i knew then what i know now i would have asked for more <laughs> because they all said yes <laughs> but i didn't ask for a lot when we first started, we thought we needed the most famous names that we thought we could connect with to be on our advisory board, but we didn't ask them to be advisors. We just wanted their names and their stamps of approval. Now I would say, would you really give us advice or would you give us money? But then, so we got, so I contacted Marin Alsop and I remember being super, super nervous about it and then getting a yes. I remember contacting, um, Judy LeClaire, who at the time was someone who I would never have considered contacting, except that I was like, I did it. And she said, yes. And um, people like that. Uh, so, so starting something is, is being willing to ask for stuff and being okay with getting a yes or a no. Of, of our initial advisory board names, no, I didn't ask anyone that said no. Those were all names that said yes. Those are all the people we asked. And um, there was a dean of a school of music on there, Robert Friedman. Oh, what's his name? Friedman, I think. From UT. He was he was Kristen's dean, so that made sense to ask okay. him. Conductor, we asked Joanne Folletta, and I I'd, I'd known her from when I was in the Virginia Symphony for a very short time, and she remembered me and said yes. And I didn't think that she would remember me. I just didn't think much of myself. I didn't think that people would be, would remember me or know who I was. So starting something is just having that confidence and courage to go for it. Michael has shared a, a um, nice comment. Yeah, <laughs> He says, I can't imagine you feeling that you didn't fit in. 
and you are so personable. So yes, <laughs> very true. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And yeah, I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, uh, I mean, the bassoon world did not feel like a world I belonged in for sure. Michael, I just, I didn't see myself there. I didn't see any, I didn't see examples of myself. Um, you know, I didn't even know about, I felt so behind, you know, cause I didn't even know things that other people knew until suddenly I'd learn about it. You know, you know, like for example, one example is, um, Curtis, I didn't even know that place. It was a place until I didn't even know that if you go there, you have special, you know, it's a special path. And if you can go there, then you get a special path. And I'm like, I didn't even learn about that path until I would have been, I couldn't take it, you know? So I always felt really behind on what you're supposed to do and what you're supposed to know. Um, and, and shy and awkward. So I really appreciate that, that I've come across as personal because I've created for myself a world in the bassoon world that I do feel I could belong in, you know? And you're, you're in it, which is really great. <laughs> yeah. Something I wanted to ask you about, Nick, was when you were creating, you know, these components of, of the Meg Quigley Vivaldi composition and symposium where we had speaking elements, we had the performance element, the memorization, yeah. you know, and collaboration um, with yeah. the, well, can you share about like. I mean, all of that was basically because it was stuff that I wish I had learned. How, how to speak from the stage. I, I felt so incredibly bad at that and so awkward at that. And I would <laughs> try to be like the people who were good at it and I just would fail. And so I realized we got to maybe figure out how to learn how to do this. And maybe it's just because you've got to start doing it. Got better and better at it as I did it. And we weren't really giving young people a real competitive reason to do it right like if you're if that money isn't if you're not gonna get that money unless you jump through that hoop of learning how to speak from the stage like you're gonna learn to speak from the stage right mm -hmm. and there was a lot of resistance at the beginning there was resistance from a lot of people about that one feature people thought it was ridiculous there were judges that would say this does not matter at all and we'd say actually why don't you just fill out this rubric and do it just go ahead and we'll fine, you know, and there were contestants who were really resistant to it. But um, it was because I was like, if these young women, and I was thinking specifically a lot of the time of Latin American women, women from Latin America. I mean, I was always hoping that there would be more of those entering and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I was like, if you can get this skill earlier, You'll, you'll be a leg up. And then what was the other one? Memorization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So totally. It's, I, I think we started the competition by the time I was starting to learn how to memorize. <laughs> and I was like, if only I had learned this 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, because if you, if you have some confidence in memorization, then, then you're going to be better at your orchestral auditions. You're going to be better at every recital you do. Like everything you do is going to be better because you know you can memorize. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then once when you perform from memory, you get that experience of truly singing, like truly, if you're, if you, you know, you got to do it a few times and get, yeah, it's not like anything, you got to memorize and do it a few times. And the Vivaldi piece, of course, was super inspiring to me that Vivaldi wrote these pieces for young women. I was like, that was no brainer. And, um, what was the other component? And playing with the chamber orchestra. We had the opportunity to play, um, yeah. I think, was it starting in 2010, the yeah. playing with a small orchestra yeah. in Oberlin. Yeah, that was that was George Sagakini's idea. That's great. It was fantastic. We can, yeah. we can thank him. And then we just kept, the, kept it going. Yeah, getting a chance to actually perform. That was big to, to do it. Yeah, so those are all things that I thought, well, if I could have done that all earlier, it's very selfish in fact. It's like, if I could have done this earlier, maybe I would have gotten farther. Then. You know, that kind of feeling of, well, what was the missing for me, you know? 
all of those things like I use in my everyday life. The key that I, the thing that helped me finally was to realize that it wasn't what you say, it's who you are being when you say it. It is not what you say at all. Like, I don't think, I, I still really don't think that the content is as, as important with who you are being when you say it. And, you know, you get all caught up in the content part, but if you're just yourself and you allow the audience to see you, they're going to listen to the music better. But it takes a long time to get that, right? Some people seem so good at the content to me. Like, a, um, mm-hmm. you know, they can go on, on the stage and, and that part of their brain is okay so they can use words. Mm-hmm. For me, I walk out on stage and that, the part of my brain that uses words is not okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Words aren't great to come out. <laughs> so then I have to kind of, you know, just open up and let let myself show rather than try to impress or we also made a big deal once we started having once we had once we started having recitals at the end of the night in 2010 well in 2010 we didn't make a big deal about it we sat in the audience and realized oh my god we're having these people play and they're not speaking what what did we do uh oh, because that's what happens at every single make we sit there and we're like oh oh we didn't do that right we gotta fix this for next time Mm -hmm. so in 2010 we had people walk out on stage and play and then get off the stage and we thought oh this is terrible because this we're supposed to be role models for these young people (laughs) so the next time we're like please speak from the stage and they're like oh i remember um one one artist is more nervous about the speaking from the stage than playing and expressed it backstage like i I just don't like to speak i don't like to speak i don't like to speak and we're like well and then they walked out on stage and was and were wonderful. And that kept happening. We're just like, no, no, you're going to speak. Oh, I don't like to speak. And then they do it. And now we don't even need to tell people. Now people, you know, they know that's part of playing at my Quigley is you're going to, you're going to, you're going to talk. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, thank you for that, creating that space, you know, for professionals too, to feel safe that they could build that skill too you know and just kind of push out of that comfort zone and in a way we all were being role models for each other and inspiring each other and um yeah that's beautiful lee has mentioned in 2010 was her first visit to meg quigley and it was a fantastic experience so thank you for sharing that lee and then carol's made a comment um that's why the gorman made such an impact in January and she was being so expressive and authentic. Martin, that pre-performance talk was the most terrifying part of my Quigley performance. I know, man. I still, I know. I hear you. (laughs) (laughs) I do think it uses a different part of your brain and and what you have to use to perform. Anyway, and it's different than just a public speak speech too. You can't just take a speech class, you know, and learn how to speak from the stage about music because it's not the same thing a question from Nicole and it's about just, you know, what's something that you wish you'd known in your twenties? So I read this question because Julie sent me some, said, this is what some of the questions are. And I, I was like, how, oh, what am I going to say to this question? Like, what do I wish I had known in my twenties? <laughs> so thanks for the tr- tough one because see the twenties, you people, it, I, I, I thought through my 20s, like what, all the stuff that happened, you know, people make really bad decisions in their 20s. 20, the 20s is when you just make, you just choose paths because they seem like the right decision. And then you spend the next decade kind of figuring out how to work with that decision that you made. And yet, if you went back and talked to yourself in those 20s and said, you know, you're not going to want to do this, you're not going to listen to yourself because you're not going to listen to anyone. You're just going to do what you think is right. And so it's the greatest, greatest, greatest decade because you really are making big, risky decisions that are wonder, you know, that you've got to make. So there are so many things in my 20s that, you know, were probably like I, I, I didn't finish my master's degree, right? I was t- grown ups were telling me, you know what, even though you have a one year position in a full time orchestra, like you probably are going to need to get back and finish that degree. 
you're going to want it later. And I'd be like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then when I decided after that one-year position was done not to go back right away, I had the grown-up saying, you know, you're going to have to work this out. Like, go back and finish that. And I said, no, what I'm doing right now is important. I was already, I had already had the taste of orchestra life as a pay, you know, full-time thing. So I was going to chase that. Why would I go back to school if I already tasted the, you know? So I just went and now here I am looking at that 20 year old making that decision at the 20, whatever I was, 23, whatever. Thinking like, honey, you really should have finished that degree. Okay. <laughs> but if I had, then I wouldn't have done this other stuff, you know, that I really ended up, um, doing and you know even even on the personal side like um you know you fall in love in your 20s and you you know i ended up making a commitment that i thought was going to be forever in my 30s i had to clean that up and ended up divorce and everything but if i had gone back and said to that 20 year old no probably these issues are going to come up in the future i'd be like shut up i don't regret any second of it it was a wonderful <laughs> ride and that now I have this other life that, you know, that came out of that one. And so the twenties, what would I have loved to know? Mostly just to, that it was all going to work out. But I think I already knew that. I think 20, in your twenties, you got to just believe that it's going to work out. <laughs> On a bassoon level, I could have practiced more slowly. Pro I probably didn't practice slowly enough in my twenties. <laughs> But if you had told me, they did tell me. Everybody was telling me. <laughs> exactly, did any of us. <laughs> so, and then there's this, I had this colleague when I was right at the end of my 20s. I landed at Wichita State University, which was a job that I loved. Well, there were a lot of things about it I complained about while I was there. But looking back, you're like, oh, that job was so great. Um, but I had a colleague who told me she was kind of my age now, then, I think. And she said, you're gonna look at your life, it's gonna look like a series of arches. And those arches are chapters. And sometimes when you're in the chapter, you don't realize like how long of the chapter it's gonna be or how short the chapter is gonna be or how, you know, when it's gonna end and when the next thing's, what the next chapter is gonna be, blah, blah, blah. But it's like in a series of arches and you can, you can see it from, once it's done, you can look back. And that's totally true. Like, I can see that now. I can see the little chapters or the big chapters. And I, maybe what I wish I had known then was how to not, how to recognize and let a chapter close and then go to the, because I, I can sometimes like be reaching back mm -hmm. rather than just saying, okay, done, go forward. However, if I had actually done that in my 20s or even afterwards, that quickly wouldn't still be going because. I would have given up a million of times. There were many hints and clues that this chapter could be done, that mm -hmm. I could, I could just be finished and move on. <laughs> but because I just can't let go of anything and I'm keeping, you know, I keep trying and grabbing into the past. It's, I end up, it's where it is right now. Is there anything just administratively working both sides as a performer and organization and artistic planning as a dean? So I go back and forth because, um, like the, the, the times that Meg Quigley have almost fallen apart and gone down, <laughs> the times when I feel like I'm on my own, which is not true because there's always people there, but sometimes yeah. I end up feeling like I'm on, like any human being does. And combined with when I'm trying to fix something that's wrong. After the first, like after Hillary Clinton won, lost the first time, that was a real blow because I really thought, I mean, I mean and then when, when tr the second time, I mean, both those things were hard for me because as a woman, mm -hmm. I just felt like, oh, my quick, like the things that we had been trying so hard to do weren't working. The world wasn't showing that all this stuff that all these women have been trying to do wasn't working. That was from the perspective of, well, what we're doing it is something to fix it. And when you're trying to fix something that, that that's that broken or so huge, 
there's you can't and what had started the whole thing was that it would be this wave of goodness out into the world that would influence the change and that make the change kind of occur more you know would it would just be a, a lovely wave of good influence instead of the solution I applied for an idrs and it was going to be a program of music by women and people of color and this was a few mm. years ago and it was rejected and it was like really like, mm. what's going on? things like that just kind of wore on me because uh -huh. i was like well the world's not it's not picking up on the clues here you know yes and then once i would remember like oh wait 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 what this is about is empowering people and creating that little wave and you don't know what what it's going to do but it's just making then i would get back into it and and i would talk to my team and my friends and they'd want to help yes. when i was in fix it mode they were not interested in helping it wasn't exciting to them they had mm -hmm. busy lives so i realized that that is there in all forms of art organizations like like academia you know mm -hmm. i also felt like things were not rolling i kept feeling these microaggressions sexism things and and then I realized, well, why, why am I, why can't I just get involved and be a part of the conversation? And that's when I started realizing, well, let's say maybe I've been hiding out. Maybe I'm not involved in the conversations and maybe I should ask this new Dean that just came on board mm -hmm. how I could be more involved and instead of just complaining about it. And so when I told him that, then he came back and said, will you be an assistant Dean? I was like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so then I realized, I said, yes, I realized how much my administrative experience in McQuigley was mm -hmm. going to help me and serve me. And I didn't realize that when I started doing all the grunt work that McQuigley, there was a lot of grunt work to get the stuff going. You know, you have to write emails and um, answer them and create <laughs> rules and then stand by them. And we made lots and lots of mistakes lots and lots of mistakes that we then you know would need needed to fix like for example in 2007 the judges deliberated we learned what a ginormous mistake that is no more deliberation and the uh -huh. next one we did it you know uh -huh. yeah <laughs> they just <laughs> um, and and standing by the things that you decide and and having the thick enough skin to take the criticisms and stuff all of that was was useful and helpful when I started doing it on the college level. And I feel like being an, now I'm an associate dean instead of an assistant dean, but I feel like I am part of a solution and I can help people. Michael has shared just, thank goodness you didn't let Meg Quigley Vivaldi yeah. competition and symposium go. <laughs> well, it's not just me, it's people. It's, it's reaching out and talking to people. There were times, Michael, I gotta tell you, where I would say, all right, this is, I've taken so many hours of my career. Like, what if I hadn't been doing this? What would I be doing instead? Maybe I should have been doing those things. Like I didn't mm -hmm. practice because I was doing that or I wasn't, you know. So it's time for me to step away. And then I would go through the process of trying to step away and realize, oh my God, the reason I feel this way is because I'm not opening up to my team. It's because I'm not really sharing. Oh, it's because I'm not really, you know. And then I would, and then it would go to the next step because mm -hmm. the team would actually take it to the next step you know it's not all about you know it doesn't have to just be one person <laughs> you know since i have been the person raising all the money i mean from the very beginning not so much anymore but for years i felt like that was my responsibility that was a big weight because i had to have it succeed the weight of getting the money <laughs> you know you say this thing is going to happen you say you're going to give money away and you got to yeah. get them <laughs> well when we realized that we couldn't just depend on one or two people giving the money, we had to start. It was yeah. actually Sue Shire Bancroft that said to me, you know, this thing is, I'm going to support you. I'm going to help you out. And, and I know that other bassoonists will too. And you have to ask. And she coached me on just making calls. And so I called a bunch of bassoonists that year and people made donations that were pretty hefty, pretty hefty, just regular bassoonists donating a thousand dollars, five hundred dollars, you know, and, and it, and we, it got us through to the next year. And then, um, we started realizing, oh, the industry would probably want to support us, which 
we don't want to have the industry tell us who to have play, but we want the support. And we got Lee on board who, you know, I said, can you help with this part of the project? And, you know, we need maybe this much of the chunk of support to come from the industry. And how did you suggest doing that? And she's like, oh, I'll team up with Shannon Lau and we'll create something. And then next thing you know, it's truly a community supported thing. Like so much of the money comes from just registration, people registering at 150 bucks, 150 bucks, 150 bucks. And then so, and, and, um, and then the, you know, Lee blew it out of the water thinking in a totally different way about how to get, it wasn't just saying, oh, Fox, can you give us a ton of money? It was, hey, small business owner, do you want to, I mean, Lee can really speak to her plan for this, but it was beautiful. There was little small business owners, you know, jumping in to be a part of it. And it added up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's what I mean about, about other people coming up with the good ideas. Carol made a comment and just about how her students were so afraid to make mistakes. And so it's helpful to hear, you know, we just got to try stuff. Lee has shared just, I love that Meg Quigley gave you the experience to succeed as assistant dean. It gave you what it has given, you know, it, it gave you what it has given each of us and Shannon. You empower us, Nick. That's beautiful. And Carol shares, now you're a woman with a vision and the power to make it happen. But no degree. That's the catch. <laughs> if I can go back to that 20, because now it's like, oh, what's the next path? Once you're an associate dean, you could maybe do, you know, be a leader in, in the world of academia. Higher ed. Wow, interesting. But you got to have degrees for that. And I don't. Mm. So that 20 year old in me that was like, oh, I don't need to finish. Now I'm talking to her and saying, <laughs> <laughs> that would have been good. <laughs> Aura shares, it's such an inspiring story. People like Aura, specifically Aura, <laughs> I should say, and people like her, but specifically Aura, you know, basically came up to us as soon as she discovered my Quigley stuff and said, oh my God, anything you need, I'll help you. You're doing great stuff. And that encouragement and that kind of, that confidence that, that she gave us, it was really important to get that. So, I mean, yeah, it, thanks to, I mean, Aura, thank you. You're, you're, you're a big engine. I mean, it really means a lot that people love it because I didn't know it was going to end up like this. We didn't know, right? I mean, we were just trying to do this thing <laughs> and it evolved and it evolved and it evolved. And now, I mean, I think about January and I still get a good feeling about just being with everybody and meeting people and hearing the music like Martin, that piece you brought to the table to play. I was like that night. I mean, the I still get a, I still know, think that was my favorite part of 2021 so far, you know? <laughs> Arua has shared, it's great to see the leader to light us. Thank you, Nick. Carol says, giving women power leads to wonderful things. What's something new that you've learned recently that you could share with us? Well, I, um, I did learn how to poach an egg. I didn't like poached eggs. I didn't like runny eggs or anything. Until, and I just recently, during this pandemic, started um, like sauteing, trying to eat better, okay, because... I really lot like we, my family, we just started eating when this pandemic hit. We just started being at home all the time, just eating all the time. It was really fun and lovely, but got to rein it in. Um, so one of the things I'm trying to do is have one meal a day that's just really simple and healthy. And what it is, it's just like a pile of vegetables sauteed with various spices or whatever, topped with a poached egg. <laughs> But I had never poached, I didn't know how to, I, I got, I don't know how I got into it, but I, it's not so easy. You can, I mean, I bought these little poached things, mm -hmm. throw, got rid of them. They're not right. It's better to just, you know, you swirl the water around and you put the egg in. <laughs> and, <laughs> just a regular uh, so I feel like I've gotten better and better at that. I didn't think it would be something that you'd have to practice, but yeah. And also one thing I learned recently was this year was how to edit little movies. I, I've had a lot of fun 
if anyone was at those at those concerts at Meg Quigley, the opening little thing with all the inspiring pictures to get you to give money, all that stuff. I did those and it was really fun. And um, I would never have known how to do that before if I hadn't been forced into. Um, oh yeah, uh, KWJ on the keys. I made that little ad reel. And my team was a little skeptical about that. I remember sending it to Dave and Dave's like, I don't know if it's good enough. <laughs> First, he says, the images are blurry. You have to, and I'm like, okay, I got to go back and edit better, you know. <laughs> but the music, that was really fun. So I, I love that new skill that you can produce things just in yourself, even someone like me who isn't that technologically savvy. Is there um, like a book that you're finding really inspiring right now? If I think of, of the music books that I, that my favorite music books for teaching, one would be, the Art of Possibility by mm. Ben Zander, Benjamin Zander. That's a good book about just seeing what's possible in music and um, one's life. And I really like recommending The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. I mm -hmm. think that's a fun book to read to get some insights into how we learn and how we teach. The book I am that's open that I haven't finished yet on my bedside table and I actually haven't read it in a couple of weeks. I was super into it and then life kind of got it, took my reading time away. But it's a book by Malia, Malika Tubbs. And it's about the mothers of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X and James Baldwin. It is wonderful. It's wonderful. And she is lives in my town. So, yay. I've been in the same room with her. So I'm a little starstruck by her, by the author. Is there a class, you know, that you wish could have been available when you were studying? I didn't really like classes. <laughs> hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't. I know I'm a, the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I remember thinking that I didn't think ensembles or lessons were courses. I, I thought courses were like your theory, you know, classes. Now I'm like, oh, that's a course. <laughs> anyway, um, I, in addition to, uh, I think that I got the most, what I, what I wish we could have done more of is the project-based learning. Like if there could be a sandbox where you could have play money and play audiences and play, you know, like you could create projects in the sandbox and actually just practice doing things safely. Um, I would, I just would love that. And I don't know how, how that would look, but um, the things that I got the most out of in college were the projects that I did. I mean, the Oberlin and Panama project that I started in college that taught me so many things about how to, how to, you know, ask people to do things and raise money and and organize a camp and organize classes and stuff like that and which I then was able to use right later and it wasn't a course you know and if it had been a course I probably wouldn't have taken it so that's the dilemma you know how do you how do you create these opportunities for students in college that aren't courses but that could give them this experience to be able to play around and do stuff where you can make some mistakes you know made mistakes in that project in college, I, I ended up, in, you know, having a falling out with really good friends over stuff, you know, and then realizing, oh, later in life, learning from that, you know. Yeah, so that, I don't know about a core, a magic course that I would have, I don't know if I would have taken. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a great question, Lee. You know, these classes on how to make movies and stuff, I mean, I learned that stuff just by myself. I think we all know how to learn stuff. We just, we have to create the reason to learn it, you know? Like I, I learned how to make a little my eye movie because I had a reason. I was like, well, am I gonna pay somebody? Am I gonna ask someone on my team? And then am I gonna like, okay, okay I need to get this done. Okay, I'm just gonna learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now it's like, oh, this is so fun. I, I can do it. <laughs> A course that I wish, I also, Lee, I mean, at Oberlin, I took a lot of courses in the college and I, I still, I can remember 
stuff I learned in those courses. I carry the books around. Even to this day, I still have books from not mu non-music classes. And I wish I could do more of those. Even now on at Pacific, I all, every semester I think, would I have time to just sit in on a class in the college? Something interesting, you know, film or, well, you know, just some interest, because I see these really interesting courses and I think, oh, wouldn't it be fun to take one of those not related to music? Um, I think that would be something I would like more of that would feed my curiosity. A curriculum that's not so limited. That's what I'd like. Can you name a bassoon composition that you're loving right now or practicing that maybe all of us can have a listen to or check out? I My student had a recital this, this afternoon, and he played the Ida Gudkowski concertina. So Anne Shoemaker recorded it, and I heard it then, and I'm like, oh, nice piece. I'm oh, playing a piece by a woman that people don't know. Okay, whatever. And then fast forward. Uh, Jeff Lyman did the talk at Meg Quigley about the Paris Conservatory pieces and heard the piece again. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I heard it. Oh, it's such, yeah, I'm, I like, okay. And I, you know, and then my student picked it for his recital because he loved, he fell in love with it from that recital. And he picked it and he started rehearsing it and playing it and I'm in lessons. And each le lesson I would say, oh, my God, this is really much cooler than, okay. Th and I just started to know it, right, mm -hmm. to the point where then I heard him in the dress rehearsal and by then, I'm just like, this piece is so cool. And then the, the recital, he just knocked it out of the park. And, and um, you know, the piece was written the year I was born. And I didn't even learn about it until not that long ago. And it's really a shame, a shame. Because all those other French competition pieces that I learned, I heard people playing in studio, right, when I was in college. So I became familiar with those intervals and, you know, the showy stuff. And I just learned it in my, you know, and then like, boot, you know, the boot tree, pieces like that, where you're like, this is a weird piece, but you hear it and then you love it because you know it, right? And that should have been in the same category. That, should, that piece should have been played so that I knew it in that same way. And it's, it's really cool. And I'm super excited that it's, Make, making its way to where it should be, which is just another one of those French showy pieces that are really hard that have really high notes and beautiful melodies. <laughs> so I, I love it. And I'm, and I, and I admit freely that it, I didn't love it the first time I heard it or the second. After hearing my student play it, I returned and listened to her CD again, but where she re recorded it, you can find it online. And I heard it, he had unlocked some things that I hadn't heard. And then I was like, oh man, oh man, the way she plays it is so beautiful. So that's where you can check it out. So we'll go ahead and end the session here. And Nick, just thank you so much.